Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session of learning about how to make decisions at a startup and about zero to one products in general. Uh, my name is Chander Chavla, and I have been a founder of three startups. I worked at, um, at three or four startups as VP or head of product. So I think in total, I have launched at least 25 zero to one products uh, in both big companies and startups. Um, and the and I've advised, I don't know, 40, 50 startups on launching products. So in total, I've seen products go through maybe 60, 70 products go through um, uh, the process of coming to life. And you can learn more about me on LinkedIn. I have a blog that's cdoc.blogspot.com. I am a co-host of a podcast that's Valley Nordic. And that's about um, providing um, Silicon Valley and Nordic perspectives to uh, people, mainly in the Nordic countries, uh, because the venture capitalist who's the other co-host is based in Norway. Uh, so let's get started. So before we get started, let's do a, a quiz or uh, to set the frame or the discussion. If you look at the slide here, there are three options um, since this is not live. So let's see. Generally, when I do this presentation live, most people say C is the wrong answer. A, B, and D are the right answers. And we assume, because we mainly deal with base 10 arithmetic or addition, that anything that doesn't fit into that frame is wrong. So C is right if you use base 12 addition. So base 10 is A, B, and D. C is using base 12. So that's kind of very similar to going from a big company to startup or uh, uh, doing things at a startup, you have to think differently. So in essence, this presentation is all about how to think about making decisions at startup. Uh, let's go to the next slide. That's what is a startup about or business in general? So at a very fundamental level, startups or business in general is about four things. First, you need an idea. And that idea becomes a product or a service. Uh, you need a market for that idea uh, or product service. And then you need capital to grow that business. And you need people uh, to execute work on building the product, marketing, sales, etc. So when we say um, execution, that, oh, execution is really important in startup. It is the interplay of these four things, product, market, capital, and people. Uh, so it's important to know uh, as product managers uh, who are listening to this is product is one part of the interplay that you are responsible for. But you have to think in terms of what is the market, how much capital is it costing, and what kind of people do we need or what we have, what we can do with that. Then um, another you know, framing is uh, given that there are things, um, or let's see how you think about knowledge. So knowledge, you can structure that into two things. One is things that are knowable and things that are unknowable. So knowable things are the things you can learn uh, from others, from reading, from talking to people, so in a startup construct, you can learn, you know, um, about people, capital, technology, get the product, what the market is, what the competition is, what the history is. But as a startup, you are creating something new that's innovation that has not existed before. So this is something new where we don't have a track record or history. You can find similar things, but actually how it will work in the real world, you can only find out by doing. 
So that's the unknowable zone. So that's where the innovation happens. That's where, or the innovation operates in the unknowable zone. So meaning things you can learn only by doing. And that's where startups are, especially in the early stages. So now what we'll go through are seven heuristics that I have learned um, from my own experience working at startups and also launching zero to one products in bigger companies. Uh, but they're derived from teachings of uh, Dr. Yanir Bariam, who is a complex system scientist, and I've attended uh, New England Complex Systems Institute uh, programs or work with them. So a lot of the credit, what I will share, goes to Dr. Uh, Yanir Bariam. Um, and you will see many of them are the mistakes I've made. So I, my point of sharing these uh, mistakes or learnings is that you don't have to make them and you can change your thinking before you make the mistakes. So let's see what they are. There are seven of them. First is um, business plan is useless. So when you're launching something new, innovating, creating a startup, uh, it, there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of variability of what will happen, ambiguity, randomness, everything you see on the uh, slide um, here. And I got it from uh, Nassim Taleb, who's another author, uh, I think it's been very influential in changing my thinking. So they operate in this domain of uncertainty and ambiguity. And plan is about the future. You are stating that you're going to do something, you know, in X number of years, this will be the revenue and cost and growth, et cetera. But you don't really know. It's all made up. So that's why I say it's useless, especially in the early stages of a startup. Instead, what you need is a learning plan. So there you, as we just talked, you're operating in the unknowable zone. So what do you want to learn in that unknowable zone that can only be learned by doing? So you figure out a plan. This is what we are going to do. This is the hypothesis we want to um, uh, task by doing, and these are the things we want to uh, learn. So I think a learning plan is much more important than a business plan. But, you know, uh, in the real world, when you go to a venture capitalist to ask for money, they all want a business plan. And even at a bigger company, you need to show a business plan for your new product idea. Uh, so what do you do? So I've seen this so many times, so much detail goes into finding the uh, accuracy of, you know, the models uh, in Excel we create, oh, is the growth rate going to be, you know, 97% or 93%, you spend hours, you know, trying to be precise, or the conversion rate is 3.2% or 4.9%, all that doesn't matter, you know, you need a plan, and everybody wants to see a hockey stick, you create a plan that shows a hockey stick. Otherwise, you won't get funded. But so spend less time on creating a business plan and spend more time on uh, doing a learning plan. So the, uh, to summarize the learning here or heuristic here is plan less and do more. Um, and that doing involves uh, creating a learning plan and executing on it. Okay, next is winner takes all. Uh, that's mainly applicable to digital products, which most of them are today. <laughs> uh, so the picture you see here is uh, Vin Wilfredo or Vincento Pareto. He was a famous um, uh, mathematician in Italy. He came up with the 80-20 rule, which I think most of us are familiar with. Uh, it's also called Pareto rule. He observed that 80% um, of the property in Italy was owned by 20% of the people. But it applies two levels deeper. So if you take 80% um, of 80%, it's 64%. 
And if you take uh, 80% of 64%, it's 50%. And then on the other, other side, you have uh, 20%. So if you do 20% of 20%, that's 4%. And if you take 20% uh, of 4%, that's 0.75%. So you can say 1% owns 50%. So if you are uh, one company, that means can own more than half the market or majority of the market. So that's a very, I think, powerful insight um, in the digital domain. And there are many examples in the business world. So you can see the market share of uh, search, that's Google, owns uh, I don't know, 80, 90% or huge number. Uh, Uber owns majority of the market in ride sharing, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many examples of that. So how do you apply that uh, to uh, your startup or when you are building products? So you have to think big, but you have to act small. Um, and if you are not getting bigger, you may disappear. And the reason for that is, let's say you start a company, you don't really want to get bigger. You are happy with you know, owning 10% of a niche. But the other players in the market are trying to get bigger. So they will gain more efficiencies and they will you know, gain more and more market share and eventually come after the niche you're targeting. And if you are not growing, they may acquire you or find drive you out of business, then you may have to sell to them. So you have to put this, you know, thinking in mind of, okay, growth, especially in the digital space, is one of the key elements of uh, success or winning in the uh, startup space, especially for digital products. So the lesson is think big, act small, because early stages, you have to make small, you know, maybe, um, you know, let's say you're launching a product, just launch in one city, just launch to thousand people. So you prove the hypothesis, have a learning plan, but always having that vision in mind that you want to be big. Um, otherwise, you may disappear. Okay, next is understanding causation. So you, you may be noticing that I'm taking examples from outside of the business world, how they're applied, can be applied to the startup world. So what you see here is um, a graph uh, of uh, UN food price, in, food price index, where uh, you see the red lines, that's where the food prices went up. Um, and it, you may remember um, Arab Spring that happened a decade or so ago. And if you ask most people in Silicon Valley why that happened, I think most people would say it was because of social media, camera phones, people were protesting, and you know that's how it happened. But that's not uh, the causation that didn't cause it. These, these, these things existed before um, uh, you know, the revolution or Arab Spring happened. So what caused the Arab Spring was the increase in food prices. The food prices doubled, uh, more than doubled in many cases, as you see on the graph. In the countries listed here, and you see this is the number of, uh, I think in the parentheses is the number of deaths uh, in, the, in that country because of the riots and protests. Um, so it, it's very applicable to startups because I see uh, over and over how we don't really understand causation of why people buy, are buying or using the product. To give you a practical example or first-hand example, I was head of product at a company and when I joined, I had to decide the roadmap. So do we you know, focus on making the machine learning algorithms for the core of the product better or add new features? So how do you decide? So we had like 30 something features in the product. I asked the team, which ones are we, you know, are being used? And, you know, nobody knew. 
So then I went to the customers and I asked them and I learned, um, we had to figure it out. They weren't quite sure either. Uh, out of 30 something features we had, only two were being used. So that told me, okay, we need to you know, make those features better but that was a harder thing to do than creating something new, but that's critical because that's why people are using the product, not because of all the features we have. So as a startup, what do you do? So let's say you have a product idea and to simplify, let's say it has two features, A and B. If it's a digital product, you can launch three versions. There's version for feature A, version of feature B, and a version with A and B. And then you see, okay, which one is um, more in use and it'll give you a crystal clear understanding of, you know, how people are prioritizing. Users are actually using the product, what's causing the adoption, usage, or purchase. Uh, so you, you have to find ways to understand that causation. So the lesson is get a crystal clear understanding of why people are using the product. Uh, next is do not confuse risk with probability. Uh, this uh, example I got from Nassim Talib. Um, so <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, there, I think every year, a few hundred people die from falling from ladders. And you can see, you know, you can predict. Okay, there's all this data from last 40, 50 years. These many people are dying from falling from ladders. Um, so, you know, it's not going to become millions of people next year. We have all the past data. So the probability is, you know, very high that the number will be close to what it was uh, last few years. But on the other hand, uh, the risk of dying somebody from terrorism you can't you don't know it's unknown you can look at all you know 50 years of data and you still don't know what's going to happen tomorrow so the risk is much higher uh, of uh, dying from a terrorist attack than from falling from ladders but how it's portrayed in media sometimes and even scholars you know phd you read these articles oh you know the threat is over of terrorism and you have higher risk of dying from you know traffic accident or uh, you know falling from ladders than from a terrorist attack so i think that's incorrect uh, the risk is higher with a terrorism attack because we don't know the past data doesn't tell us anything so how does that you know <laughs> apply to startups or decision making so it applies that you have to create optionality because as a startup, you are operating in a high risk area. You know, if you look at the data, uh, most of the startups fail, but that doesn't determine necessarily your outcome or your success. So you have to, uh, since you're operating in that high risk domain, you have to find optionality of your idea. Have optionality. Don't fall in love with the original idea. Think of other options. Many of the successful startups have pivoted or evolved their idea. So if you fall in love with your idea, it's um, harder to uh, you know succeed because it, you you take that idea to the market and market doesn't agree with it. Then what do you do? So when you're designing the product, thinking of architecture, think of how you can make it flexible so you can do other things um, with it and test a lot of options, especially in the early stages when you are trying to figure things out, what uh, would work with people. Okay, next is um, TMI stands for too much information. Too much information increases confidence and not accuracy. So the chart you see here, I, here is analyzed GDP growth um, in percentage uh, from 1950 to 2010. Um, and the yellow area is the great moderation. So you see until 
1985, there are huge swings in GDP growth in the U.S. It could grow up to 15% one year or, you know, uh, decline by 10% in one year. Um, and Ben Bernanke was the Fed chair um, in two th early 2000s. He gave a talk or lectures on the concept of grade moderation that, you know, the era of this wild swings in GDP is over. Now we are in this era of grade moderation. And uh, I think most people would know the power the U.S. federal chair has. <laughs> uh, everything they say, it's analyzed to the nth degree. You know, when Chairman Powell now, when he speaks, like there's commentary for hours on CNBC, on Bloomberg. Oh, he touched his nose. That means he wasn't sure. Like everything's analyzed. So they're very, very cautious in what they say and what they don't say. So if they, if Bernanke, you know, came up with this uh, concept and gave a, a lecture, that means they had done a lot of research. Hundreds of PhDs worked on this and came up with this uh, idea. And then what happens? Uh, you know, uh, next year in 2008, uh, the market crashes. Uh, the GDP goes down more than 5%. So uh, the point here is, you know, such smart people, PhDs working at the Fed chair, can get confident with the amount of data they have, then so can we. So you have to find out, um, you know, how not, <laughs> are you getting overconfident with data? And there are many examples in the business world of that, that people had thought they had a lot of data. It said one thing, but reality was something else. And how it applies to startups is, um, you know, understand correlation among the variables in your business like how is marketing related to how much spent customer acquisition cost with uh, product development, with how much capital is needed, how the customer success or support, uh, things are increasing when you launch a new version of the product. And there, because there's too much information in the world, how do you stand out? How do you position your startup for success? Because how do people find out you exist? So one of the tricks I see that Mary Meeker, who is uh, one of the venture capitalists she uses or used to use was, um, you know, saying things in aggregate when they presented numbers uh, about wearable devices, which they had investments in, they would say the aggregate number of steps people have taken using a wearable device. So that, you know, number is in trillions. Uh, the total number of steps people take in a year. So that, you know, raises uh, uh, like eyebrows or you pay attention. But you, if you say the same thing, okay, people take 10,000 steps in a day, there are 365 days in a year, you divide that by number of steps, the actual number of devices in use is probably at the time was a few million. So, it, that doesn't raise any attention, doesn't make you stand out. So find ways how you can stand out and rise above the noise for too much information in the world that people are getting every day, so you get noticed. So find ways for uh, uh, making your startup uh, position well in the market. And next is replication with variation and uh, selection with competition. This idea comes from biology. So the uh, theory of evolution that Darwin came up with states that genes, they replicate with variation. So, um, and let's say there's a gene A, then when it replicates uh, or goes to the next generation, you have a, A1, A2, A3 and they compete with each other, and then the, uh, let's say, A3 wins in that competition, and then that uh, reproduces again and on and on. So that's the general idea. I think the venture capital world 
um, and uh, Silicon Valley and many other places around the world work in a similar way. Some idea gets hot and then a lot of investment goes to that idea. So for example, right now, Web3 is hot. Like everybody's investing money in Web3. Before that, it was AI. Before that, it was uh, big data. Before that, it was cloud. Like there's always something where the money is going. So how do you, you know, position yourself in that world because you need capital to get the uh, to execute on that idea. Like going back to the earlier slide, you know, capital is one of the core things uh, for a startup. If you run out of capital, it's over. So you have to, you may have to position your startup that you are able to get attention from the venture community and raise capital, and even. You may have to do that, you know, in a, a big company as well, whatever, it, in all big companies, something's always hot. So you find ways to position yourself, uh, do you get funding internally or uh, externally for that idea to make a product and then find a market, etc. That doesn't mean you just copy what everybody's doing. You have an idea and if you are having, if you can raise capital with that, Great, but if you can't, you may change the positioning. Let's say you're using some uh, ML machine learning in uh, for some simple task in the back end. You can position yourself as an ML company, but that doesn't mean you change. You succeed by creating value, but to succeed, you need capital. So you may have to play the game of where the money is going uh, wearing that hat to get the capital and focusing on creating unique value. Next is um, competition and cooperation uh, work together. So this is really interesting because the example I have here is from sports. So let's say, you know, the American Football League. Um, so the Sport at the sport level, you're competing with all the other sports. Football is competing with, uh, you know, basketball or Netflix or any other forms of entertainment. But the teams collaborate to form a league and they advertise so people come and watch the games, etc. Uh, and at the team level, teams compete with each other. That's the sport. Uh, but if you go to the player level, then the players uh, are collaborating within a team to win the game, but they're also competing with each other to win the sponsorships, get more money, get more followers, et cetera, et cetera. So depending on the scale you have um, you uh, or where you're operating, you have to see the competition and cooperation work together. So in the tech world, you know, uh, a lot of the competitors align to fight that we uh, keep the principle of net neutrality in the US. So that's the teams, the companies collaborating. And since this is an open environment, I'm based in Silicon Valley. Uh, people talk to each other. Generally, people don't try to hide the idea. So if you see somebody else is doing the exact same thing you're doing, then you try to do that differently. Um, and um, that actually reminds me, it, the previous slide where I said the competition is also among the startups, a lot of money goes into uh, different uh, forms of the same idea and they compete and the one, you know, uh, one of them wins. Uh, okay, coming back to here, what do you do with that as a startup or how do you make decisions? So choose the right environment, which is open, so you can learn what other uh, companies are doing and adapt your idea and have access to capital and act capital connections and competence. So choose the right place where you can have that. But I think that's changing now with things getting remote. So I think startups will have more access to capital uh, connections and competence things are getting developed. So let's summarize um, the seven heuristics as they apply to the startup or entrepreneurial success. 
First is plan less, do more, create a learning plan. Second, think big, act small. If you're not growing, you may disappear. Third, get a crystal clear understanding of why people are using your product. Four, don't fall in love with their idea. Test a lot of options. Five, understand correlation amongst variables in your business. Position your startup to be noticed. Six, pick a positioning category where money is going and focus on creating unique value. Seven, choose the right environment, which is open and gives you access to capital, connections, and confidence. And there is a, uh, an article I wrote about the subject in Forbes a few years ago. The link to that article is uh, here in this presentation. Uh, but if you search my name and Forbes, you will find that as well. And the other things I've learned are on my blog, and you can learn more about what uh, I've learned from the startup world and product uh, on our podcast. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Bye.